Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the all college meeting. I'm delighted that you've joined us. Um, I want to just start out by uh, offering a big thank you to everyone in the College of Engineering, the students, the staff, the faculty. I know that the challenges of the last two years have just been stunning. Um, and I can't express uh, all of my gratitude and just, uh, I'm just super proud of what everything's been doing, everyone's been doing in the last two years. The faculty pivoted on a dime. They were able to go remote and offer labs remote. The staff always overworked, but hanging in there and running this giant machine. We're up there uh, holding, you know, anchoring us down. And the students, we just expected them to be resilient and kind of roll with the punches even though their educational experience wasn't quite what they had anticipated. So I just want to say how thankful I am, I am that everyone has really pulled this wagon forward. And I think we're going to come out of COVID in a really great spot. I know for one, I'm super tired of Zoom meetings. Uh, I strain as a result of that. I've taken up backpacking again, but uh, to try and get out of my little isolation room with my computer. Um, I'm eager to start traveling again, and I think you guys are too. So again, just a huge thanks to everyone in the college for everything you've been through and just for your continued excellence and hard work. What I'm going to do is start out. We have about an hour together. I'm going to give you a brief uh, update of the college. I'm going to uh, give you a preview of our implementation plan for our strategic planning uh, event. And then uh, what I'm going to do is introduce Karen Thomas Brown, our Associate Dean and of the Office of Inclusive uh, Excellence. And she's going to give you a deep dive into the DEI section of the implementation plan. When I walk around the college and meet people, the most common question I get answered is, Nancy, what are you doing to make this a welcome and inclusive place for the faculty, staff, and students? So I thought for that reason, we would take a deep dive um, and let's showcase all of the really exciting changes we have ongoing in engineering. Then we'll open it up for question and answers. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, uh, email your questions to engineeringuw at uh, uw.edu. We'll do our best to answer all the questions, but if, even if we can't, we'll get back to you. So I wanna start out with our land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, the Tulalip and the Muckleshoot nations. First, I thought out by uh, I thought I'd start out by reviewing uh, the dean's office leadership. We have a fantastic team here in the dean's office. Lots of changes in the last two years. Um, several of these folks will join us uh, to answer uh, questions about our implementation plan. But my message to you is: we are here to serve you. We are here to make your jobs easier. So feel to, free to ping any of the people on this screen. Let us know what you're thinking. Uh, let us help you out when you encounter challenges. So not only do we have fantastic leadership in the Dean's office, but we just have some amazing people that have stepped up to the plate in other areas. Uh, these include our new chair of bioengineering, Princess Imokwede. Um, so we're super excited. She's joining us from the state of Missouri. Alberto Alizada, our new chair of mechanical engineering. And you can see we've got Lilo Pozo stepping up as our interim chair of material science and engineering, a new associate dean for advancement, Dave Ayel. Um, and then uh, super thanks to uh, Mary, Mar Mary Ostendorf for uh, being willing to serve the entire university um, as the new vice chancellor for research. So again, things are ever changing on the COVID front. Uh, last week, we got some great news from the governor. Uh, the local health agencies have announced that our COVID cases 
are going down like a rock. Um, our hospitalization is going down also. So we're really uh, starting to see some changes in policies. Uh, we're gonna see changes matched by UW. Again, this is great news. Some of the exciting news I think is if you're at an outdoor event, over 500 people, no mask anymore. Um, we are gonna continue to do masking indoors at UW facilities um, through the end of the fall quarter, but stay tuned for changes. I think things will be changing fast after that. We're really waiting on guidance from King County, the Department of Labor and Industries uh, to begin to move forward. But I think this is good. we're gonna be in a time of change and it'll be good change instead of the opposite that we've been going through. Uh, starting March 1, vaccine verification will no longer be required at a lot of places like museums and theaters. Uh, so good news on that front also. And I have to say that UW has done super well uh, compared to other universities during COVID. We had this holistic approach to COVID prevention um, and 97% of our students and faculty uh, were vaccinated. We had no on-campus tr transmission of, of these large uh, super spreader events. So that's, uh, we're particularly proud, but really it was the UW uh, student staff and faculty that stepped up to the plate to make this happen and keep our communities safe. Uh, we're gonna be, continue to be as flexible as possible uh, during COVID. We know everyone has about had enough. So we're gonna try and work with everybody uh, make sure everyone stays safe, health, um, healthy, give our students, continue to give our students the best possible experience for the educational uh, progress, and really continue as a team effort to get through the remaining part of this pandemic. So again, a huge thanks to the team out there for making this happen. What I wanted to do also is share some of the things ongoing with our students and how we're really working to support our students during their first years in the College of Engineering. You know, we've now had direct uh, to college uh, admissions in place. We take our students in in their first year and we want to build programs to support these students and ensure that when we take them in, they graduate and get their degrees. So provide a holistic, supportive experience uh, before they're able to join their majors. So we have, yes, you know, our engineering undeclared majors uh, come in again to the engineering college. They now join first year interest groups, figs, kind of like the fruit on a tree. Um, but the goal is to help them build an academic community. So they have colleagues and collaborators they can work with. We also connect them to the engineering uh, peer educators these are current students that know the ropes, can offer guidance and help our new students out. And they're all connected into the engineering advising staff so that they're plugged into curriculum and activities, et cetera. And that way they really have a home away from home in engineering. There's one program, set of programs that I'm, uh, I think is gonna be spectacular for the college. That's our Pathways for Inclusive Excellence. And this is about supporting students that are traditionally underrepresented in the fields of engineering and computer science and making sure that they belong and they're able to succeed also. So the partnership includes the nine uh, engineering degree granting units, the Allen School, so computer science and computer engineering, and it draws together three critical uh, diversity programs really to provide wraparound support to all of our students, no matter what their needs are. So this includes the Dean's Scholars Program and it's equivalent in the Allen School, uh, the Startup Program, and of course, uh, our uh, Washington State Academic Redshirt Program, which everyone probably knows as STARS. Startup and the Dean's Scholars, again, holistic programming, uh, help as the students come in, uh, summer uh, transition programming, and then really holistic academic advising, really helping these students make this transition and have a, a real cohort experience as they come in. And our STARS program, just an amazing program with a huge impact, uh, supports our low-income, 
first gen students, students from underserved backgrounds with a really specialized curriculum focused on math and core science pr prerequisites. So again, a whole uh, span of support systems for our students, I think super exciting for the College of Engineering. Again, I, I just wanna also say that the College of Engineering is doing quite well on all other fronts. We're 22nd in their US, and News, uh, US News and World Report. So tied with Princeton. Uh, I think of Princeton as being a rock star in engineering. So we're in a good company. Um, we're also ranked higher than a lot of our peers now, UC Santa Barbara, UC Wisconsin, and we're steadily climbing the ladder. We're continuing to grow in our size. So we're about the size of UC San Diego and University of Colorado and Boulder. So we're getting up there. Our research expenditures, we're just knocking on the door of 200 million. So that's pretty exciting, I think. Um, if you look at our percentages of women and undergraduate, uh, of, uh, historically underrepresented individuals, we're beginning to climb in there, those areas. Also, uh, women, uh, tenure, tenure track faculty are about a third of the college faculty now. So again, we, and we continue to be number one in the source of all UW startups. So not only do we have awesome students who we're supporting, but we have just amazing faculty and the staff that are helping us all succeed. I love this slide. This slide tells you that we are great for the state. Uh, we're a great investment. Not only do we serve the students of the state, but we serve the people in the industry. We are almost a $600 million economic impact to the state. That is just amazing in my mind. And so you can see our other stats. We are really, I think, helping to the state in its economic recovery. And so that's exciting and it's win-win for everybody. I think another exciting thing is our new interdisciplinary engineering building. Um, as many of you know that over the past 10 years, uh, the College of Engineering has nearly doubled our degree output yet our space has only grown about 18%. So we've got a big space gap or space deficit. And in particular, our space gap is in a space that's um, team-based education for students, collaborative learning, uh, hands-on learning space. You know, engineers need space to build and destroy stuff, uh, learn the failure points and then do it all again. So the IEB is going to be this kind of space. Um, and I think it'll give all of our students not only support these formal interactions, but informal collaborations and teaming, club events, et cetera. Importantly, I think uh, it's going to be great for the Allen School and for our engineering departments, because it should help to decompress some of their space when they're able to move some of their curriculum programming into the IEB. Hopefully it's a win-win for all of our 10 uh, academic units. And again, we'll have industry capstone space. Uh, we'll have student advising. It'll house programming for our leadership, diversity and access programs, classrooms. Again, um, I think I'm, you know, I'm almost ready to go back to school uh, just so I can take classes in the interdisciplinary engineering building. So look forward to that. People are asking when, when is this gonna happen? Uh, and the answer is very, very soon. So you're gonna see site preparation in the spring. Those old funky trailers are gonna start to be dismantled. We'll get groundbreaking uh, towards the beginning of the fall uh, quarter, so September-ish. Uh, construction beginning at that similar time. And then we're looking forward to completion in 2024. So um, this is going to be really, I think, quite tremendous for the college and all of the faculty members and students in creating this real home away from home for all of our students so they can go back, get their services, and have a place that they're really anchored to and they know they can always get help. And then I want to tell you a little bit about our strategic planning. Uh, when I came on as dean, one of my goals were the reason I took this job is because I want to take this college to the next level. We've already got awesome faculty, students, and staff, 
we should be recognized for how great we are. So I wanted a plan uh, that we could capitalize on, execute and move forward. Not only that, but I didn't want it to be my plan. I wanted it to be, to be the plan of the students, staff and faculty. I wanted you guys to come up with the brilliant, creative, innovative ideas that were gonna ca uh, cause the College of Engineering to jump forward and showcase um, all of the great things we're doing. So I really uh, see this as the way we're gonna spend our energy, um, our time, how we're gonna allocate resources, and it's just the collective vision. I'm gonna present it to you, but it's really the college's vision. It's been a long journey. Uh, we started this, uh, hard to believe, in the spring of 2020, just before COVID hit. Uh, and we've just been hammering away at it, despite COVID. And I think this is gonna be great because we're coming on the back end of COVID with a plan, we're ready to execute, we're ready to go, because we still worked hard during COVID and identified all of the things we wanted to do. Again, this is over 300 people involved. Uh, we had um, a steering committee, we had subgroups, we had a website that we took in feedback. We got huge amounts of feedback from across the community, UW, and even from industry and government uh, organizations. So this is, I think, really, it's more than just engineering. It's the plan, I think, for all of UW and the state also. So again, I, I am, if you can tell, as Dean, I'm really excited. And I have to thank everyone. This was a huge lift during a difficult time. So thanks to everyone that stepped forward and helped lead this and participate despite all the other work you were doing. We had two fearless leaders for our planning effort. That was Susie Pun and Nate Sniadecki. I don't know if they knew what they were getting into uh, when they agreed just before COVID to do this, uh, but I can't thank them enough for uh, being brave, creative, and innovative and charging ahead no matter what was thrown at us. Um, so we're now, uh, I'll show you some of the strategic planning priorities. We're in the middle of the implementation plan, uh, and I'll go over exactly how we're doing that. But March, uh, you'll see the implementation plan published. And what I'm gonna do today is just preview a small subset of the activities we're gonna be doing. And I think when you think about this collectively, it'll hopefully, hopefully begin to kind of uh, give you the wow factor. So uh, the big picture, our strategic priorities. And I won't read these, but again, these were a collective decision by everyone contributing to the College of Engineering. And one thing I wanna note is that all of these include students, all of these include faculty. There's a role for staff and everybody in each of these things. So it, they're very cross-cutting, spanning all the traditional uh, disciplines of engineering. How are we implementing it? We want to actually execute on this. We want to have real goals, metrics, and milestones that we can check and say, hey, we're getting it done. Hey, we're falling behind. Or hey, we need to do a lot better job and get over some of these uh, challenges. So look for that to come. We'll have a five-year roadmap that will roll out again in March. Uh, but what I'm going to do is we'll, you get an annual report every year saying where we messed up, how we're gonna do better. I'm gonna showcase a few of these now. So our first priority, again, um, creating a healthier and uh, more just world through our work. Our curriculum, we want it grounded in public good. We also wanna be translating our discoveries into real world applications. We want our research to be focused on the public good and to be help people live better lives. Uh, we wanna also think about how do we, again, making people live better lives, healthcare issues. I think COVID has shown precisely, it takes engineering and medicine working together so that we can all live great lives. So let's give you some examples. So this is from our priority one. And again, the first part is to have an um, industry uh, curriculum advisory committee. 
We wanna make sure we're meeting changing demographic and societal needs. We wanna make sure our students are prepared to go into the workforce. They're meeting industry needs, for example. So we wanna hear from our industry partners, for example, on AI and ML and other areas. We'd like to see more big center grants and institute uh, proposals from the college. So we're gonna put in support structure uh, so that there's more, it's easier to do this and the barrier to put in uh, these big uh, uh, programs, that, uh, grants that require a lot of work, there's a lower barrier. We want more of our students uh, engaged uh, in healthcare related um, activities. Uh, Capstone is one example. We want to launch a public good uh, faculty fellows program. I would really love to see some of our faculties taking sabbaticals to work in governments, uh, non-governmental uh, organizations, community organizations, really um, entities that serve the public good. Um, and I think we can begin to play a much bigger role in addressing uh, systemic societal issues. Um, and really uh, interacting and interfacing with government a lot better to so tackle some of these big challenges, challenges of our day. So what I want to note is that I'm going to, you'll see I've got priority three up here. Um, again, as a reminder, Karen Thomas Brown will do a deep dive into priority two. Uh, so I'll skip on to priority three. Again, we want to be a, a, a cross-departmental collaborative entity. That's how we're going to solve all the big problems. Uh, we would also like to make sure our students and postdocs have the same options that they can go out and change the world, either through social or commercial entre entrepreneurship. And again, we want to work with industry a lot better. What are some of our examples? So we're hoping to work with um, faculty, uh, the various um, review committees to revise our promotion and tenure guidelines and merit review to recognize entrepreneurship as a, a core thing that uh, engineering faculty do. So look forward to this. Uh, we'd like to again ensure that 50% of all of our engineering students have some experience uh, with commercialization and entrepreneurship. We wanna work with the Foster School and Comotion to make this happen. We're also trying to be pretty innovative in working with industry. We've got this fabulous community around us um, across the state of Washington, the Puget Sound area. Really, it's a competitive advantage that other colleges of engineering don't have. Can we do really cool and innovative things like have joint uh, faculty, academic, uh, faculty, academic, and industry positions? We could really break the mold here, I think in a good way. So our final priority, um, again, is investing strategically in our future. We want to develop a better brand identity for the college that captures our excellence and impact. Uh, we really want to make sure our staff have a, a pathway to grow and excel in their careers, uh, and so provide the right programs for them. We want to, like a good engineer, use data analytics to assess and improve our performance and planning, and of course, increase operational efficiency. Again, some examples. We'd love to grow our graduate uh, programs to meet industry uh, demands, but also to support our departments. Examples are SHARP programs, certificates, PMPs, and again, serve the local industry and the industry of the state of Washington a lot better and fulfill fill their gaps. We'd like to launch a series of career advancement and professional development programs from our staff. We wanna keep our awesome staff. They, our staff are so amazing. I want them to stay at UW in the College of Engineering and have a pathway to build their careers um, because we depend on our staff so amazingly. Um, we want them to be happy also. And then we'd like to develop a collaborative support program. So when departments have gaps in their administrative portfolios, we can jump in and help out. And again, data analytics for forecasting, financial modeling, things that all great engineers should be doing. So just as a quick summary, uh, we really wanna have a safe on-campus experience. Uh, that's my goal for the rest of this year. Uh, get through uh, winter quarter, quarter, spring, 
keep everyone safe and healthy and happy, uh, have us ready to execute on our strategic plan, start executing on the strategic plan, the implementation, reporting back to the faculty, staff, and students where we are, how we're building value and supporting everyone in the College of Engineering. Get the IEB launch. This is going to be spectacular for everybody. So I'm uh, really excited about that. Now I'd like to introduce Karen Thomas Brown. She's going to do a deep dive into her the DEI strategic plan and really how we're working to transform the college and make it a better place for everyone. So uh, Karen, uh, please take it away. Hi everyone. So as Nancy mentioned, I'm going to attempt to do a deep dive into what we do in DEI for the college. I started last May. And since then, we've done a lot of work in terms of strategic planning and just building out some of our initiatives. So I'm going to go ahead and start talking a little bit about that. So we're looking at the framing for what we do in the DEI space. And it's important that we have some context for the work that we're doing. So what I've pulled for you is a frame that we used as a basis for establishing our strategic plan, as well as the initiatives we decided to build out. And this is just a little bit of framing that covers about 20 to 21 years of work in STEM engineering and in DEI. But at the core of the work that we do, I really want us to focus in on this diagram that we created for the team in the Office of Inclusive Excellence. And I'll tell you a lot more about the office when we get into a further slide. But we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things we learned really quickly was that people tend to use the DEI interchangeably. And so we wanted to decouple that and explain those phrases pretty clearly. So when we talk about DEI in engineering, we're talking about diversity as in engaging the full spectrum of social identity of the people who come into the college. So we're shifting it away from just counting numbers. Then when we look at inclusion, we're looking at active and intentional and sustained engagement. And then we go over to equity where we concentrate on mindsets and how we can foster learning within this space, but at the intersection of DEI's belonging. And so what you see at, at the core is how can we actively engage all the persons who come into the college? And so we use that as a basis. So starting foundationally, we began with the IDI. The IDI started before I took on the role of AD for DEI. And that started sometime early last year. And the IDI is our intercultural development inventory. And it uses the 7S analytical framework to sort of collect and analyze data and spit out results on how is the college, how is an organization functioning within the realm of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it also is useful for giving the baseline data that we need for our planning, for our development, for organization around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so in the college, what we started out with was this multiple data points, looking at where we could collect information. So we started by looking at a college's shared value, the commitment, reporting and challenges people experience, notions of fairness and equity and equality, individual experiences, as well as discussions around awareness. And so we use these various data points to sort of spit out some results of what it is and what our position is right now. And what we discovered very quickly is what you see on the screen and I've sort of truncated all the diagrams to give you an overall view of where we are as a college. So you'll see that our perceived orientation is that for the most part, we believe that we're at somewhere near acceptance in terms of our perspectives and our views and our approaches to DEI. And what that means is that people assume that we not just know the problem, but we know how to strategize around it and solve it and take certain actions. But what we actually discovered were, was that we're more along the lines of minimization, which means therefore that we do know that a problem exists, but we do have a lot of challenges in terms of how do we solve problems and what steps do we take? Why is this important? Collecting this data from the full college then tells us how do we communicate with a group when almost 69%, which is what our results showed us, which is 69.5% of the college are actually at minimization. But it doesn't negate the fact that we had 22.5% of the college actually at acceptance level, which is actually pretty good. For most organizations, there is not that large a percentage of people at acceptance. 
And so it does allow us to gauge what are the programs and initiatives we should focus on? What are the strategic goals that are most important? And even more significant is how do we talk about DEI when everyone, when there's a large percentage of people at minimization? The other outcomes that came from our intercultural development inventory is we were able to identify what are our DEI strengths within the college. And so we discovered that we do have a collective shared value and understanding for DEI. We also recognize that there are clear commitments and aspirations and there are significant efforts. And one of the things we discovered really quickly is that those efforts tended to be scattered around various departments. And so there was no coordinated effort that tied all the departmental efforts together. There's a lot of optimism as well as people are aware of some ongoing events, but there are also opportunities. So there are many who wanted to know, so what can we do? What should be our next steps? And so we also looked at the data to pull out what are those positions for opportunities that we can pull from to build and grow our DEI agenda within the college. And so we knew very early that we needed a consistent and integrated strategy, one that was not just centered on one department or one group of people, but one that was coordinated across the college. We know that we needed to improve our communications infrastructure around diversity-based issues. We also know that we need to provide consistent and coordinated approach to learning. So we weren't learning the same thing in multiple different ways and having varied understandings of how it applies to our particular groups. And we also know that we need diverse representation and a deepening understanding of what we mean. So what that did was it gave, after we were able to pull that data together, and so a lot of this data came out in a report back in July of 2021, and it does live on the College of Engineering website under the Erling Solutions reports. And so you're all able to go there and do a deeper dive into the outcomes of these, this data as well, if that's something you're interested in doing. But what this information did was it gave us our marching orders. So it pretty much told us what it is we needed to focus on. And so one of the first things that came stood out for us as a team was that we needed to develop a strategic plan. And that strategic plan needed to have implementation phases, but more importantly, operationalized steps that we could use. We also needed to establish and improve the college's DEI infrastructure in terms of what are our overall goals as a college? And have we been able to articulate that to everyone? And is it clear? So in other words, are we all saying the same thing around the EI? And are we all taking the same sets of actions to achieve our common outcome? We also needed to improve and review our college communications infrastructure and accountability systems around DEI, as well as we needed to ensure that we were all brought up to speed as it were in learning. So we have done some of this work already, by the way, but we also needed to ensure that all the leaders in the college got common training and common knowledge on DEI. And then we needed to increase that awareness across the college community. One of the first things we did after we figured out what our marching orders were, was to create the Office of Inclusive Excellence. So we created the Office of Inclusive Excellence to one, elevate the importance of diversity, equity and inclusion to the college, to say that the college was willing to do more than just hire one person, but to hire a team of people who had a common mission to grow the college in this particular space. And so what we have as our mission for the Office of Inclusive Excellence is to really move diversity, equity, and inclusion away from just programmatic solutions and anecdotal evidence. We are very much theoretical based. We're very much strategic and tactically focused, and we're grounded in policy. So we're not just looking at what programs exist that we can use as a band-aid to fix a, so fix a problem that we we find, but we're looking more at how are the policies of the college ensuring that we do get to the point where we are equitable, we do get to the point where our students do feel included and our faculty and staff do feel like this is a welcoming and valid place for them. We also have as a part of our mission creating a sustainable model for the work that we do so that 10 years from now, after we've gone through five years of implementing our plan, we can still look back and say this works and this doesn't work and why doesn't it work? And so we're not looking at a stopgap measure, we're looking at a long-term goal. And so one of the things we did was once we created what our mission looks like, we put out a vision statement 
And as we were putting out the vision statement, it became very important that we looked at what was our theoretical basis for having diversity, equity, and inclusion in a strategic plan. And so we sort of backpedaled a little bit and looked at our theoretical base. And so we chose to go with inclusive excellence. Excellence because the engineering education we provide is excellent, but inclusive because we want that engineering education to, be, to be both inclusive and expansive. We want it to take into consideration the social, emotional, and psychological safety of our students, faculty, and staff. And so what you see here is just a quick overview of what our theoretical base for inclusive excellence and the Office of Inclusive Excellence looks like. And as I said before, it's targeting inclusive and expansive work for our students, faculty, and staff. It's looking at our intellectual and social development, and it's championing an excellent education that allows all our students and faculty and staff to feel welcome, valued, and supported. The diagram you see on your screen gives you a sort of an overview picture of how we have rolled in inclusive excellence into our mission, our vision, our structures, our systems, and the skill sets that we're building out within the college. This then takes us to the next big charge from our IDI survey, and that's what were we going to focus on for our strategic planning and our strategic goals. We chose four major pillars and four major themes that we thought were of critical importance. So we looked at our people, our capacity, culture, and social and public good tends to be a more cross-cutting theme. For people, we're looking at how do we attract, select, retain, and elevate a diverse group of people across a wide cross-section of communities. We're also looking at capacity. And when we think about capacity, we're thinking about inclusion. So what is the infrastructure we're establishing? What are the policies we're laying out to ensure that when people come here, they are included, and they're not fighting to be included, but they are on the spot thought about, and sometimes thought about before they actually arrive. And then we look at our culture, which is our equity factor. When you arrive, are we fully engaging you? And if we're not engaging you, what are systems and structures in place to ensure that we can get a feedback loop and we can ensure that we are engaging all? And then we look at social and public good and how it cross sex with DEI. And what we came up with is that when we look at social and public good in diversity sphere, it's recognizing that engineering offers an education that fosters social responsibility. But beyond fostering social responsibility, what it does is that it says that there are problems in society that are have engineering costs, but they also have engineering solutions. And we can learn around these broader te themes. Now, after we did that, the one thing we did from our strategic plan was to look back at our mission, as it were, and we recognized that we needed some common community statements so that those who walk in knew that when we talked about DEI, what were we committing to as a college? So through our strategic planning, through building out the Office of Inclusive Excellence, we commit to racial justice and equity. We commit to honoring sovereignty. And you'd have seen at the beginning of this broadcast that the land acknowledgement was read. And we're going beyond just reading the land acknowledgement when we commit to sovereign, honoring sovereignty. We're going to the extent that we're recognizing the inequities caused by certain institutional forces that result in the marginalization of certain groups. And we're ensuring that we do our best to build relationships that will actually honor sovereignty. We also commit to gender diversity, inclusive excellence, social responsibility, collaboration, and more importantly, disabilities. Disabilities seen and unseen, because we know that this does impact the, our students, our faculty, and our staff. And so we want it to be clear that these are the areas that we're making broad commitments to. Now, after we did our strategic plan, we started looking at what are the operationalizing that we needed to move into. And so we considered what are the successful strategies that existed. And so I'm going to pull out a couple of those successful strategies to talk about today. 
So we did our strategic planning, we did our stakeholder analysis, we operationalized a lot of what we did. We then looked at what is our long-term commitment to DEI, hence the creation of the Office of Inclusive Excellence as seen here as OIE. We then started growing our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion across the college by connecting with various departments, various units, and various groups to have conversations about what it is they want and how they want to see themselves reflected in the work that we're doing. Then we put out our community statements, which I've showed to you, to just demonstrate that we are committed to the dignity and respect of all peoples within our college, and we will not support or condone any form of discrimination. Then we look at how can we increase faculty numbers in terms of diverse representation, and we've done a lot of work towards that. We also look at what are the efforts to target increased diversity in, in engineering in our underrepresented minority groups. Nancy alluded to our PI program earlier and how that is one of the efforts we're sort of digging into. We are also looking at how we can do further work in that area. And then we're also using metrics because it's good to say this is what we're doing, but it's great when we are able to measure it and say, these are the outcomes we've managed to achieve. These are the things we need to work on. This is where we need to tweak our plan and update it. So in other words, we're not being reactive to what's happening around us. We're being very strategic and tactical about how we approach DEI. As a part of the Office of Inclusive Excellence, we really went in and looked at who are the various constituents within the college, what are the needs, and how can we build out an office that is multi-directional to support all those needs. And so what we see here is that we've we staffed this office, by the way, about 80% so far. And so that has been really good for us in terms of the work that we've been able to do we have an associate director for engineering excellence, and that's Robin Clayton. And her job pretty much is to deploy a lot of her strategic engagement. She's also training focused. And that's a really good thing because what it means is that within the College of Engineering, in a few short months, we will be able to roll out our own training modules that target people within the college, but represents people within the college and represents the needs that we've been told are there for various training. And and various knowledge growth. We also have an assistant director in Scott Pinkham for academic affairs, and he works closely with how do we do outreach in the academic sphere to our underrepresented students and what are the services that they need that we're able to provide. We have an assistant director in Catherine Jordan who focuses on gender equity as well as our student groups. And we're expanding our notion of gender equity. And we're not just saying women in engineering, but we're also including other social identities, including our non-binary individuals who will want a home and a space here. We also have a student specialist who is Ali Cho. Her job is to look at student experiences and plug into all aspects of student experiences to ensure that we are doing the work we promised. And then we have our communications. So we communications is important. The the best kept secret is not what we want. We want to be known for the work that we do. And so having a communication specialist who's able to not just broadcast this work, but also plug other people into what we're doing is actually critical. I think one of the small wins that we're really happy about is the DEIO roles. So a DEIO is a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, and that's a departmental role. We have our first DEIO person in mechanical engineering. He works for the department, but plugs into the Office of Inclusive Excellence. So we provide strategic direction, we provide resources and tactical planning, and that person is deployed to serve the department in their strategic planning, in their implementation, in their initiatives building, in their programs, and also in supporting faculty, staff, and students. And so we have several key initiatives because we know even though we do a lot of policy work, people still want to see what it looks like when it's actualized. And so what you see here are our nine core initiatives that we'll be launching. And we're now in the process, now that we're partially staffed, we're now in the process of building out these initiatives through multiple partnerships. So we have our Office of Inclusive Excellence. We will be rolling out an Inclusive Excellence Faculty Fellowship Program come fall of this year. And we're absolutely excited about that. We have our Elevate Program, which will target minoritized graduate students in their psychological support and their 
social and emotional supports. We have our Let's Talk Diversity series that we're working on and that we will definitely be rolling out shortly. We are working on it behind the scenes. We are growing our DEI knowledge and that will be a part of the knowledge base, growing out our training modules. But we also bring in external partners who support us in this process. We have our Inclusive Excellence Student Internship that we will launch shortly. And another big win for us is our We Rise program that collects all our gender-based diversity programs, put them in one umbrella program, and then break it out into different events. So the We Rise program will have five core components and four signature events that we will be presenting to everyone. We're also plugging into our student advisory groups. And as Nancy mentioned before, we're building out our PI program to ensure that we are providing wraparound services for our first generation Pell eligible um, students who are underrepresented within the sphere of engineering. Now, I just wanted to give you a quick view of what breaking out and building out one of our initiatives look like. So in just the general themes, we're building out our Inclusive Excellence Faculty Fellowship Program. We're looking at inviting one faculty member from each department, and they come in with an existing course that they teach. And then over the course of two to three quarters, we teach them about inclusive excellence. We teach them about inclusive teaching practices. We get them up to speed in terms of their capacity and knowledge around DEI topics and issues within society. And then we support them to grow their course, keeping the structural and content integrity of their course, but growing their practice in this area to be more inclusive for their students. And so we're looking at collecting data to support each faculty member who come in. We're looking at committing ourselves to supporting their learning. So if we build capacity in faculty members and it trickles down to students, we're reaching a wider number of people. We are looking at how we can ensure that as we build out the Elevate program, it's sustained, not Elevate, sorry, or inclusive excellence program, it is sustained. So we hope to bring in a new cohort of faculty fellows each year. We're also looking at saving these courses when once the person has updated that course syllabi so that we can then use it to support them and support others later on. And that just gives you a quick idea. And finally, what you see on the screen is or broken out of our six signature initiatives and how we are going to be measuring success over a period of time. Thank you, Karen. Uh, that was really fantastic. Um, and I think we'll go ahead and move on to the question and answer session. Uh, so what I've invited some of uh, our implementation leads to join us. Uh, you'll see, in addition to me and Karen, uh, Vice Dean uh, Jiwei Yang, uh, lower right, uh, Kojay Pan, Associate Dean for Finance and Operations, Dan Ratner, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and Tung Shen, our Associate Dean for Medical Technology uh, Innovation. So I'll go ahead and start out and read off some of the questions. Uh, the first one is for you, Kojay. Uh, everyone's wondering about merit. What's the deal there. Uh, thank you for the question, Nancy. So during our annual budget planning exercise, the provost office asked students to model annual merit increases of two to three percent for professional staff and faculty. So at this point, that's the best number that we have to go with. Annual salary increases for those in bargain positions will follow their prospective bargain agreements, as always. So we do expect to receive confirmation from the regents and provosts for a merit program sometime in the spring, and that would likely be effective then for September 1, 2022. Great. Thank you, Kojay. The next one is for you, Dan. It's been a really uh, tough couple of years for all of us, um, and our students have been really uh, heavily impacted. How are our students doing and what can we as faculty and staff do to support them? Yeah, it's, it's, it is a great question and, and it goes without saying that we, we've all been impacted and our students, of course, have been impacted like like in ways that no one could have anticipated, especially with the fatigue and the surprise of Omicron and this continued desire to see the university in our country. Uh, make this a more just and equitable society. So we, we continue to struggle and the students are, are both excited but, but anxious to return to normal. They really want to see this transition and they wanna know when masks can go away and when they can start to engage more normally with each other and go for lunches and have events where pizza is being provided. 
uh, faculty want that want that too. Uh, you know, we're, we're all tired, but the students are here with purpose. They, they really are here for their education and they want to make the world a better place. And there's one thing that we can do that, that they have told us time and time again, and it's communicate clearly. Students are asking that faculty communicate what your expectations are in the classroom. What happens if a student gets sick? How can they complete the learning objectives for your class if they do have to step out for a few days when they, when they may be ill and away from the class? Uh, but also the students are asking about how are we looking at technology and changing the way we envision teaching in the future. I think we've all been surprised about how technology came to the rescue with the pandemic and allowed us to teach remotely. And the students want to know how you can make this part of your practice going forward to make the classroom more inclusive and more accessible going forward. But they recognize that there's only so many hours in the day. So they're not asking for everything, but they do want to know that you're thinking about technology in the classroom going forward. And for our staff and faculty alike, check in with your students. It's hard to understand what they've been experiencing and how they've been impacted. And, and so really the, the number one thing we can do right now is communicate. Thank you, Dan, great advice. Uh, I have a follow-up question on that one uh, for Karen. So what are the, some of the ways that the strategic plan will uh, support the health and wellness of our, uh, the members of our engineering community? Thanks for the question. So we can go back to even the work that we're doing around the IEB, ensuring that our students have a home somewhere where, where they can gather, where affinity groups and affiliate groups can gather and just get along. Um, we support student groups through our strategic plan. So we have specific goals that target and align to various groups to ensure that we are meeting their needs. We have looked at something as simple as our bias reporting system and how we can ensure that people can trust that system to really give them the supports and access to the supports that they need. We are building capacity in terms of curricula to ensure that classrooms are a little bit more inclusive. We're also looking at other initiatives. So there are several bits of work, for instance, in the PI program, we're looking at how we can roll in a social worker for the social and emotional needs of the students in that program. So what we're doing is not going, everybody in the college gets this one thing. We're looking at what particular groups need and trying to target those needs through this plan. Great, thank you, Karen. The next one is for Tom. <coughs> Uh, can you share with us some of the more recent uh, partnerships and collaborations between the Health Sciences School of Medicine and the College of Engineering? Thank you, Nancy. There have always been broad collaboration between College of Engineering and School of Medicine. And I just wanted to highlight one most recent event is the establishment of the Institute of Medical Data Science. And this is one of the really broad collaborations between College of Engineering faculty and, uh, and students with School of Medicine as well as School of Public Health. I think it's really exciting to establish broad platform which allow us to look at data, data for health and healthcare of the future. In particular, we can look at our region and also globally to use data to establish a, a be much better equitable health care for our population. This also provides a great opportunity for us to look at data, even including other elements of human health and health care, such as, such as uh, climate change and our global change of the environment. So I think this serves as an example of how much talented faculty and students we can involve to rebuild and reshape our future. Thank you, Tung, that was great. Um, Karen, a follow-up question for you. Um, you and your team are working super hard, uh, but what can staff and faculty do to help change the culture of the college so that DEI is the responsibility for all of us and not just a, a few members of the college? Great question, thank you. So one of the first things we have to realize is that the, the team is broken up thematically. So we've looked at various issues that exist and we've looked at the various groups. And so shortly you'll have opportunities to plug in. When we start building out our initiatives, one of the things that we've been doing is contacting various groups, asking people to plug in and give us their ideas to ensure that we're not telling you what the solution is, but we're co-creating various solutions. So once we reach out and ask the support, go ahead and say yes that's one of the best ways you can plug in do not hesitate to give us feedback on the work we're doing and the questions we're asking so we can ask better questions and do better work also let's start managing our expectations we're not trying to do a quick fix 
we are trying to make a sustained long-term change. So we all have to sort of patiently work towards getting towards the goal. We will get there, but it will take some time. And finally, um, plug into the DEI committees within your departments. With the, all those DEI committees are actually plugged into a group that we sort of reformulated called CODA, which is the Council of Diversity Advocates. They plug into our strategic plan and our initiatives. And so if you're able to get into those groups and talk to them about what's going on, then you automatically get plugged into a lot of the work that we're doing. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, the next question looks like it's for Ji Wei. Um, so uh, there's lots of great industry and engineering and the Seattle market. Um, is the college thinking about mechanisms for making faculty engagement in this work easier and more accessible and sort of a follow up question? What's a good way for current faculty who would like to become more involved um, in interactions with industry and how do we balance our current workload as faculty? So kind of a three part question, if you will, Ji Wei. Oh. You're muted, Ji Wei. Pardon me. Uh, thank you, uh, Nancy. That's a, a great question. First of all, we're engaging with industry in all levels. Uh, we have lots of our work is uh, led by faculty through sponsored research, through personal or professional contact. And also we have a team in the uh, in the dean's office called corporate and uh, foundation relations led by aaron schwartz uh, that helps the college to coordinate and uh, better prioritize our uh, ongoing conversation with our corporate partners and last but not least we have a college visiting committee uh, which helps us to build better partnerships with industry a recent example i would cite it was uh, the establishment of uh, Amazon uh, Science Hub at the uh, University of Washington. I think College of Engineering is leading the effort for UW. Uh, we have uh, initially the topic for us to work on is robotics and AI. We have planned to engage other business units within Amazon to um, topics such as uh, sustainability, quantum computing, and so on and so forth. We're not only engaging with big tech companies in the area, there are lots of opportunity for us to engage with small companies, venture capitalists. So uh, moving forward, the uh, plan is uh, we are taking, continue to take this all hands on deck approach. I think uh, uh, with uh, engagement all, at all level, that's the way we should, uh, should be uh, doing. Uh, moving forward, I think Aaron Schwartz and myself is uh, taking the lead for the uh, College of Engineering. If any faculty wants to get more engaged, uh, you know, everybody is encouraged to talk to your chair or reaching out to me and Aaron. Uh, we'll make sure that we're connecting the dots here. Um, the, uh, the last question is about how do we balance uh, the, uh, the workload as a faculty member? So. The college has been very intentional uh, over the years not to increase extra load for faculty. So with CFR and the uh, Dean's Office, we usually organize uh, these events uh, uh, for uh, industry partnership building. We always try to minimize uh, the, the uh, extra load on the uh, uh, faculty member. We have uh, coordinated a lot of uh, events uh, in the past uh, few years, things like uh, Amazon Salon or engagement with uh, Intel or, or Micron and so on and so forth. So the goal uh, for us moving forward is to continue to be mindful of faculty's extra loads uh, in this area, but uh, we wanted to amplify our effect in the, in the uh, next few years by presumably increasing more staff member to uh, to support the corporate and foundation relation. Thank you, Ji Wei, great answer. So I'd like to uh, just thank all the associate deans who stepped up to the plate to field the questions. Uh, Karen, for a fabulous presentation. And then of course, everyone that joined us in the audience for taking their time and energy. We wanna hear back from you, tell us what you think. Remember, the implementation plan will be out on the website in March. Contact any of the leads, 
Remember, the Dean's team is here to help you and serve you, everyone on this panel and this Zoom. So please reach out to us with questions, comment, feedback. It's all good. And thank you again for uh, watching. And I'm just wishing you all the best for the remainder of the fall quarter. So go Huskies. Thank you.